Hello, good morning or good afternoon and welcome to this seminar on decentralized cooperation in Andalusia. I would simply like to now explain who I will be introducing, Rocío Moreno, the member of the City Council of Palma del Condado in Huelva, in Spain. She is in charge of European affairs in the uh, Andalusian Fund of Municipalities for International Solidarity. The floor is yours. Thank you very much to you always for having me here and for organizing this seminar, which I am an absolute believer in European projects and in Europe in general. And so I believe that this is a very important forum. It's the type of forum that we have to really take advantage of and and we have a lot of uh, hope invested in this webinar and in its success. And our goal ultimately is to look towards Europe, which is extremely important for all of us here today. Over the last decade, it has been made clear by the European Union that they acknowledge the fundamental role of local governments in development. And in 2017, the new European Council for Development, which constitutes a general framework for European cooperation for development and which aligns the, pol the policies with the objective of sustainable development, the sustainable de de development goals. And it reinforces this message and the need to encourage sounder and more efficient partnerships between multiple players, where, where the local authorities play a very crucial role in implementing the SDGs in the 2030 Agenda. This highlights the value of decentralized cooperation between local administrations, national and European, and also with fellow countries. And also leveraging the capacity that we have to develop sustainable development goals at a local level, submerged as we are in the health crisis brought on by COVID-19. As highlighted by the COVID-19 action plan, we are aware that the only way forward is co-creation in our communities, in our regions, and full collaboration between the different levels of governance. And we are convinced that it is important to have this sound governance system that is multilateral and able to guide us in our interconnected realities. In this webinar today, we would like to emphasize the importance of being more interconnected, having better interconnected policies in this multi-annual financial framework and providing the added value of de the decentralized Andalusian activities. It is about understanding our common challenges and having meeting points in order to build a multiplayer tool that will help us in our collaborative efforts as we implement the 2030 agenda. We must try to find agreements and consensus, strengthen our co-creation and lobbying and advocacy actions in Europe in line with the main global development agendas. And so in this framework, decentralized collaboration is crucial for Europe, for the European spirit, and it is a wealth, a richness that national, local and regional governances, their universities, their social organizations, social economy must all sit together and decide that solidarity and territories do not end where their territories end. They must understand that their commitment and their engagement towards fair and sustainable development is everybody's task. It is about making more for Europe and allowing Europe to help build a more sustainable and better world. Each of our cities and in each of our territories must contribute to this. And that is what we at FAMSI are hoping to do, and also in Andalusia, to become more united with Europe. The pandemic has meant that we cannot do this together physically, but under the alliance of, to reduce inequality, which we have been developing in FAMSI. But it has given us the opportunity to come together virtually in this forum and to provide a collaborative network in which everyone is contributing from their different spaces, forums and discussions. And what I would like to say is thank you on behalf of the steering committee and on behalf of FAMSI, the Andalusian Fund of Municipalities for International Solidarity and the Cordoba Coordination Authorities 
the organizers of the coordination of DNGOs in Cordoba and Andalusia. This event is part of our European actions and is co-organized by the Andalusian International University and is guided by the Institute of International Cooperation and Development for Municipalities, INCIDEM, who we would like to thank for their support and their collaboration. I would finally like to highlight that this event is is inscribed within a pan-European event that is called European Days of Solidarity, of local solidarity, which was implemented by Platforma, which is an organization we belong to. This campaign invites cities and, Euro and European regions to raise awareness among their citizens as to the challenges of global sustainable development and the need to prove to one another that our regions and our cities are working together towards an aware and a conscious citizenship who understand the difficulties of sustainable development and who all work together be, to achieve global agendas. Lastly, I'd like to thank everyone who is joining us today, especially three women who have made a, a bit of time in their busy, busy agendas to join us. Monica Silvana, who is a European member of the Council and Eurodeputy, and Alexi, who is the head of U the C5 unit of DEFCO of the European Commission. She is, and we also have the director of Platforma, Mar Marlene Simeon. So that's all from me. I will leave you with Teresa Godoy from INCIDEM, and I enjoy, I wish you to enjoy this day very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rocío, as you mentioned, our aim here today is to discuss and to share opinions about the 2021-2027 multi-annual financial framework and to understand our participative frameworks, explore opportunities that we can work on and how Andalusian cooperation could really play an important role in this space and help us to find new ways of funding and new ways of collaboration. I'm going to explain what this is going to be about. First of all, with the inform information and opinions that we gather through the forum that has been enabled in this space, and as well as all the information and opinions that we gather today, we will join all of this together and get a real understanding and a rich understanding of what the Andalusian Agency for Cooperation can do. We will be holding a meeting in December, as you all know. And so to favor the first debates that will be taking place with representatives who really are very familiar with this area and who are important players in Andalusia, who are references, benchmarks in cooperation, we will have a wonderful guest speaker, Marlene Simeon, who is the director of Platforma. And as you know, that is the European Coalition for Cities and Regions Working Towards Development and cooperation. She is also an expert in international and European development and helping to promote international development and all of these international European frameworks. But of course, after this debate, which is going to be moderated by Marlene, we want to give everyone the opportunity, all of the attendants, the opportunity to be able to share their questions, queries, and we would like to ask you to do this through the chat box in this Zoom meeting and to state to whom you're addressing the question. Or if it's an open question for everyone, then please also state that. And I'd like to also encourage you to really actively take part. You can do that throughout the entire event so that after the debate that we have, we'll have enough time for our keynote speakers to be able to answer everyone's questions. And we will also be using a series of innovative tools, such as the Mentimeter tool, where we will be sending out short questions and seeing your responses live. So I hope that you'll all be paying attention to the chat box so that you can follow our instructions when the time comes after the debate, after this initial discussion, our colleague Johanna will give you more of an explanation about what that involves. But the link to that app 
will be available in the chat box. It's very simple to use, it's very visual and interactive, so we encourage you also to take part in that. Lastly, we will be drawing up our conclusions, talking about the challenges that we have looking forward. Pablo will be taking care of that. And we will also, I'd also like to say that we have been working in coordination with FAMSI and INSIDEM for a long time now to help this happen. And for those of you who need interpreting, live translation, because some speakers will be speaking in Spanish and others in English. So if you need that interpreting tool, you will find it at, the both, at both of the interpreting channels at the bottom of your screens. If you have any questions, let us know in the chat box and we'll be happy to explain what you need to do. Thank you very much. And the floor is now for Marlene. Thank you very much. Um, if okay with everyone, I will, will speak in English first. Thank you very much. Um, so thank you so much for inviting me to, to moderate the session, actually. So it's really interesting how we can link up you know, the actors on the ground and, and the EU institutions and policymakers in Brussels. That's really the idea of this session. Uh, so thank you for this opportunity and for uh, speakers to have agreed to, to contribute today with their own knowledge. Um, so Platforma, as you may know, so is a, a pan-European network of local and regional governments and, and regional, national, European and international associations. And we are all working together towards uh, enhancing decentralized cooperation in many policy areas. And FAMSI, one of, the, of our uh, dear partners into this. Um, fostering the localization of the SDGs. Achieving the 2030 Agenda is of course at the heart of our activities and it's our common responsibility to move towards more sustainable socio-economic and environmental models and together through partnerships across the world. Um, so it's a challenge and, and we could see during the pandemic, during the pandemic, 19, uh, COVID-19 pandemic, um, that there were a lot of acts of solidarity and, and an increased uh, amount of exchanges of practices and knowledge between municipalities and across borders. And uh, um, we believe that decentralized cooperation is a key modality uh, to achieve uh, the 2030 agenda. Mm, at European level, I will give you now the European context and with my two, uh, with the two colleagues, the two speakers, we will uh, go in, into depth into this, uh, this European context. But to let you know that at European level, 2020 is a challenging year. Uh, a deal was found by the negotiators of the European Parliament and of the presidency of the Council on the new budget for 2021-27. Um, it was found uh, two or three days ago, but between the presidency and the European Parliament. But it means also that the rest of the member states have still to approve this deal. So it's not done yet, but it has raised the bar on climate, on biodiversity and on gender mainstreaming. So let's see what's coming up. Um, part of it will be dedicated to the new instrument for the neighborhood development and international cooperation instrument, so the NDK. And, uh, but the negotiation on this particular external action instrument is not completely uh, defined yet, uh, finalized yet. So we are now in the final rounds of negotiations. And actually today, I think there is a trialogue between the different institutions of the EU to determine the final shape of this instrument. Um, and it will include decentralized cooperation, of course. Uh, so we'll see what forms it will take. Um, so I will be glad to hear from our speakers today. What are the main elements of this new budget? What are the priorities, the challenges addressed? And maybe, or uh, if, or better said, how the COVID-19 crisis has challenged the EU approach. Um, as you know, many topics are covered by the EU development policy that are close to the competencies of local and regional governments. Uh, we can mention climate change and, and many mayors have already engaged into the covenant of mayors, the global one, or by continents. Um, gender equality, that's the art of many cooperation, local democracy as well. So we could name many more. So there is really a link between the EU and what we do on the ground. 
so we look forward to the last round of negotiations to determine whether there will be a dedicated budget line for local authorities and decentralized cooperation, or whether it will be mainstreamed in the overall geographic instruments, or whether it will be a, a mix. That will be the, the, the next steps to, to discover. So we will be glad to hear uh, today the EU approach towards local and regional governments. So, so far, the NDK recognizes one major fact that local and regional governments and their associations are key partners of development and will be consulted automatically by the EU delegations at all stages of the programming of the EU funds. So it means that your peers in partner countries will be part of the policy dialogue and this is key for us. So now I'm happy to introduce the two speakers of, uh, of this afternoon, the first uh, round of speakers. So Anna Lixi, uh, she's the head of uh, sector at uh, DigiDevco, C5 units. Uh, she is uh, persistently advocating for local and regional governments to be included in the EU development policy. And we will have also with us uh, Monica Silvana Gonzalez, so member of the European Parliament and uh, representing Spain, and she's part of the SNG political group. So you are a member of the Development Committee of the European Parliament, and you also advocate persistently for decentralized cooperation at the modality of the EU development policy, and in particular with uh, Latin America. So thank you both for taking the time for uh, uh, this webinar. So let's start now with um, Anna Lixi. So can you please tell us more in, in few minutes, in, in five to 10 minutes, can you please tell us more on the general uh, budget, MFF, multi-annual financial framework for the next seven years, uh, and in particular for the external action? Uh, what are the main priorities on the European Commission side? What is the general approach of the EU towards local and regional governments and their representative associations? And we know that the EU places importance on, on decentralized cooperation, but it also eliminates the specific instruments for its co-financing. So what will be the new windows of opportunities for local and regional governments? Thank you. And please, Anna, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marlene. Uh, before, let me thank uh, Sam C and uh, el Fondo Solidario, no, primero, es, eh, primero hablaré en español, luego yo paso al inglés porque voy a contestar a las preguntas de Marlene en inglés porque trabajamos. I will first be speaking in Spanish because that, uh, I just wanted to be able to say thank you to everyone in Spanish and I will then go on to uh, speak in English, but I wanted to say thank you so much for letting me take part in this debate. It's true that there are so many participants and I'm delighted. I'm really surprised to see so many people are interested in solidarity and that it's written into the DNA of all these people in charge of municipalities and so on in Andalusia. Thank you so much to FAMSI. Thank you to Rocio for your kind words at the beginning. Thanks also to Marlene persistently advocating so uh, so I, I i see in your uh, request in your questions in um, there are four main elements so one is more on the indici the other is on the priorities the other is on the approach of the EU, in particular, Development Cooperation DG towards local and regional governments, and the fourth is the windows of opportunity for decentralized cooperation. So I will try to be brief, but to cover all four. And to do this, I will follow a, a structure that I have. So I will be looking at my structure in order not to uh, to be too long in some parts and to and not to cover the, the rest. So first of all, the uh, Indici. Marlene highlighted that we are currently uh, in the final steps of the negotiation of the Indici or Indici, which is the new regulation uh, for development cooperation. A be better set is not only for development cooperation, is for cooperation. Because differently from the past, all instruments have put together. We will see 
all instruments have put together to cooperate not only with developing countries, but in general with partner countries. The Indici involves also and covers also any kind of partnership, international partnerships and international cooperation. But let me go to the to the sub, to the to the um, basis of the of the Indici. So uh, basically, the Indici is based on the fact that the EU cooperation will remain guided by the Agenda 2030 and the SDG, the SDG, the Paris Agreement, the Addis Ababa Action Agenda, the Global Strategy for the EU Foreign and Security Policy, and finally on the new European Consensus on Development, which was adopted a few years ago by my DG. The objective is, is uh, still, let's say, the eradicating poverty and tackling all inequalities, which is essential for people's ability to seize development opportunities. The Indici structure, how we, we, uh, uh, the, the Indici has been uh, structured. Basically, in, within the Indici, we have the geographic, uh, the geographic uh, budget lines, which cover the neighborhood countries, meaning both the countries of the Balkans and the uh, Mediterranean Africa. Uh, that to today are covered by other instruments, by the any instrument, the, the XAENPI, the European Neighborhood Policy Institute. The Sub Saharan Africa, which is currently covered, you, we know, by another kind of uh, uh, system and tool and budget line. Uh, uh, no, it's not a budget line because it, it is outside the budget of the Commission, which is the European Development uh, um, Fund, which covers the cooperation with the countries from Africa, Caribbean, and Pacific. But now, in the new Indici, it will be integrated in the budget. The, uh, the, the budget line for Asia and Pacific, and the American and Caribbean. Then we have the thematic, and in the thematic there are different kind of tools recognized, which is one on the human rights and democracy, which is uh, uh, today existing as EADHR, and a, a budget line for the CSO, a budget line for peace, stability, and conflict prevention, and the budget line for global challenges. And finally, there is the rapid response, which cover the crisis response in the conflict prevention, the resilience and leaking humanitarian and development actions, and the foreign policy needs and priorities. Let me focus on the first two, the geographic and the thematic. Well, the local and regional governments, and this brings me to the third question also, um, uh, that uh, Marlene requested. The local and regional governments are covered both in the geographic and in the thematic. So when it will be re released, the regulation, you will see that uh, it is the result of the efforts done by the team uh, working on local authorities. Some of uh, the team is, is, is connected with, uh, with us. Astu is a colleague who is connected with us, and she, she, uh, with me, we, we, we were the two really, um, uh, as Marlene said before about the advocating, we were really integrating the recognition of the role of the local and regional governments, paying attention basically to the fact that this recognition was integrated in both, uh, in both, in the geographic and in the thematic. As for the thematic, let me spend a few words on the thematic because within the thematic, I said that there are different lines. One is on global challenges. Well, this one on global challenges is also the one which covers uh, particularly the partnerships with the uh, association of local authorities. It covers the associations that nowadays we have with five big organizations of, and association of local and regional governments. Platforma is one of them, but there are other force that we are supporting. Actually, Platforma is much more than one of those that we finance because Platforma is the result of uh, uh, the, the, the commission work and commis commission decision and has been set up by the commission uh, Platforma back in, uh, uh, in the years. 
So uh, the global challenges uh, integrate this specific uh, tool to support not only the, uh, our cooperation with the association of local authorities, which is for us already a kind of uh, uh, decentralized cooperation. We basically call on board the association of uh, local and regional governments to work with us on uh, con being consulting base consulted basically on all our main uh, policy documents. We have a constant relations with these associations of uh, local authorities, these five signatories of the Frame of Partnership Agreement. So already with these uh, um, global challenges, uh, uh, in integrating the thematic challenge, we are recognizing and not only recognizing, but supporting the um, decentralized cooperation in terms of uh, policy making more than at the level of implementation, but we will see also the other part. In addition, the, uh, the, 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 global, uh, the, the thematic challenge, global challenges will recognize also the value and the importance of the territorial approach to local development and the use of the territorial approach to local development. Consequently, everything which concerns the localization of SDGs, the support to the local and regional governments in order to localize the SDGs. Let me add that there are some debates, and for the moment, I I, I will not be uh, I will not be precise if I will tell you that the DR instrument, which is the the support uh, um, given to the civil society and to the local authorities in order to raise awareness on development cooperation issues, it is integrated in the global challenges because still I don't know at this moment we, we, which will be the place of the DR. But uh, for sure, there will be also the recognition of the important role played by the local and regional governments. This uh, it's a, a kind of exception to the uh, development cooperation instrument. You know that today we are um, we are uh, disciplined and ruled by the DCI, the Development Cooperation Instrument, and today the development cooperation instrument uh, puts the focus on the fact that the funds of development cooperation instruments should be directed to the partner countries. There is an exception in that the, 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 the development cooperation instruments and this element uh, is obviously integrated in the indici because as I said at the beginning the, 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 the indici covers more than, than the development cooperation towards the partner countries. The, uh, the indici as the development cooperation instrument recognize the role of the local and regional governments in Europe so not only in the partner countries, to uh, promote the uh, awareness raising on development cooperation. So this will be a kept a still part of, of, uh, of the NDG. Um, let me just uh, now uh, go to explain uh, just a few elements more. I'm not following uh, actually the timing, so I will try to, to, to condense a little bit. Uh, when, uh, as Marlene said, today there is still uh, the trilogue on the Indici, Indici, so we still don't know which will be the result. After we will uh, listen uh, to, um, to, to the, the member of the European Parliament, the European Parliament in the trilogue proposes a different uh, approach uh, with respect to the, uh, to the Commission. So we still do not know the result. But for the moment, what the Commission has proposed, as I said, in the geographic and in the thematic, uh, the global challenges, did not propose a specific budget line, as we have until now, on local authorities. Why? Because the decision uh, has been to change the approach and to opt for the approach which is called geographization, meaning that all the support to the local authorities and the regional governments, the support to their empowerment in partner countries, the support to the reform of public administration and the reform of the state through the decentralization processes, for example, all these programs will be geographized uh, uh, as actually it was also in the past, because also in the past with the previous regulation, the DCI, 
we added the thematic and we added the geographic and also the geographic bilateral um, programs of different uh, partner country uh, development uh, uh, programs integrated the support to the local and regional governments, to the decentralization, to the uh, and, and local and regional government empowerment. So the, the, the proposal of the Indici goes a little bit one step further because it keeps the uh, importance of the local and regional governments and the support to be given to the local and regional governments in partner countries within the geographic, but uh, um, proposes also the geographization of the, at least of part of the funds, because we have seen that in the global challenges some funds are kept for the uh, local and regional governments, but foresee a geographization of a um, good part of the funds of the previous uh, budget line for local authorities. What does it imply this and what does it mean? This means integration of the programs to support the local and regional governments within the bilateral program of the different countries and within the regional program. I move to the third. Pro I, I saw Marlene. Uh, uh, yes, I, I move. Uh, I move to the other two questions. Otherwise, I will be too long. I uh, just allow me to say that the, uh, the um, geopolitical commission, which is the new uh, commission of the um, President van der Leyen, has identified five main priority areas, which are uh, valid for the internal policies and for the external policies and for the work on international partnership. I just, uh, I just list. Uh, the uh, sustainable growth, so the five main priority areas are the green deals and whatever concerns biodiversity, green and smart city, sustainable energy, circular economy, water and oceans, and adaptation and mitigation measures, obviously actions in general on climate change. The migration, the migration area of intervention, sustainable growth and job development, the digitalization, which we have realized how much is important in the time of the COVID, and the governance and peace and security. And then, in particular, our commissioner, Commissioner Urpi Leinen, would like to uh, give a particular attention in all these areas to the inequalities, to the fight against inequalities, and so intervening in all these domains with a particular attention to the fight against inequalities and to the education, because education is fundamental for the digitalization, education is fundamental for sustainable jobs and growth. Let me move to uh, the last two points. One is uh, on the general approach of the Commission towards local and regional governments. I basically said it. It was before framed in a specific budget line it is now framed in the geographic as it was in the past and in the global challenges with the, uh, the, the little details that I shared with you. And um, you will see when it will be released that we have tried to uh, integrate the role played by the local and regional governments in partner countries at any level and for all the different priorities that the Commission uh, today is uh, calling uh, us to us in the services in DEFCO to work on. Last point is the decentralized cooperation. The decentralized cooperation, I would say that there are different ways in which we can see it. The decentralized cooperation is the cooperation with you, which goes on like today in a consultation, which goes on uh, between the uh, institutions and the local and regional governments through the advocacy that is done, for example, by platform, and it is done also through the implementation. It, it is done through the implementation, so through the financing, financing of partnerships between the local authorities and the local and regional governments in Europe and the local and regional governments in partner countries. For um, up to this moment, this support has been done through the DIAR, uh, instrument through the uh, even uh, sometimes uh, through the EDHR instrument because in some cases local authorities can be integrated there. 
sometimes through the CSO budget line, but specifically through the local authorities budget line, which allowed us to launch the recent call for proposal, which were only focusing on decentralized cooperation. So it was the big, um, let's say the big revelation because at the end of the, 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 the framework, the multi-annual financial framework, the previous one, we had the two years of only decentralized cooperation. In the past, those funds were attributed to the delegation. The delegation were launching their call for proposal and only local for proposal. There were these uh, instruments. Thank uh, you, Anna. I'm finishing. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Please finish your. No, you want to. Yes, I'm finishing just saying that these that these uh, these modalities will be uh, integrated in the different modalities that uh, will be uh, identified by the different bilateral and geographic programs, and we will. Uh, uh, and ensure and exercise our advocacy in our uh, sector on local authorities, trying to recognize the presence of the local authority in as much as uh, a call for proposal relevant for the local and regional governments that will be uh, launched. This is the, what I can anticipate in terms of how it will be integrated in the regional and bilateral programs in the future. Uh -huh. Thank you very much, uh, Anna, for this uh, overview, no? for <laughs> this big picture on the approach uh, for local and regional uh, governments. So we can see that uh, it will be different, a different approach that, uh, and, and for us uh, as Platforma and with partners like FAMC, we really intend to, to understand how and to make sure that the geographic programs will be in reality accessible to local and regional governments. Because until now, the bilateral programs are negotiated uh, between between the European Commission and between partner countries at national level. So it's how to make sure that decentralization, decentralized cooperation, uh, local governments are also a priority in those uh, geographic programs. The other thing that we need to ensure the harmonization of approach that we, it should not be based on uh, like I know someone in an EU delegation so I can uh, discuss with them and uh, maybe have a program for my cooperation. No, it has to be systematized and harmonized in the approach um, also across uh, all the countries. And um, yeah, so we, we are also now in the phase where we are also explaining to EU delegation on how they should work with local and regional governments governments and representative associations. So it's an interesting phase and where also Andalusian cooperation actors have a play, uh, a role to play there also in this, uh, in this approach. So now I'm, I'm moving to uh, the second speaker. So Mrs. Monica Silvana Gonzalez. Um, I would like to ask you to, to tell us more about what are the key priorities for you and for the European Parliament in particular. Um, maybe what's the role of decentralized cooperation in the EU international partnerships policy to address the main challenges of our times? And I saw that in the chat, so the health aspects were also mentioned. Um, so do you consider the implementation also of multi-stakeholder territorial alliances useful for the implementation of the 2030 Agenda? Please, the floor is yours for five or a little bit more minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Marlene. Good morning. Um, uh, it's a pleasure for me to participate in this event. Thank you, Marlene, for your persist advocate in, in, in this <laughs> issue. And, and, and uh, it's possible to continue on in Spain. I, I prefer speaking in Spain. Okay. Um, sí, sí, mejor, ¿no? Creo. <laughs> I'm going to speak in Spanish now just to say thank you to everyone from FAMSI to Plataforma because I've been working on this for quite some time, although I've only been working in the European Union for one year, but of course I have more experience previously working in Alcalá in Spain and I I have cooperation written in my DNA and also I acknowledge the importance of giving it more resources. Thank you to Emilio Rabasco, Rocío Moreno and Teresa Godoy with whom we, uh, we have the pleasure of sharing this event today and of course thank you to Anna Lixi. I have not had the pleasure of meeting her in person but I have I followed her work here in the European institutions. 
Yes, indeed, I do think it is very necessary to have meeting points like this where we can interrelate and where we can join forces in such crucial moments like this in the European sphere where we are redefining the financial framework and linking it to uh, Hungary and Poland and ensuring that they do not block the resources that we need to move forward in each of our countries. And also because we are currently uh, trialoguing the new cooperation instrument, the NIDICI. So yes, this meeting is really very important in order to defend the interests of Andalusian cooperation and the rest of our authorities to take part because we know that these regional authorities are playing a greater and greater role in handling the pandemic, the health crisis, and in acknowledging that when difficult times come, as in the case of Spain with all the cutbacks in cooperation in previous governments, it was decentralized cooperation that kept up the level of cooperation with our neighboring countries, our partner countries, and especially between Spain and Latin America, which is often so difficult. It's very hard to defend having financial allocations to keep co cooperating with Latin America because most of these countries are considered medium income countries, but the level of inequality there is absolutely enormous, as you know. And I specifically am here to share my ideas with you, to learn from you, of course, because you are each experts in your field. And I am proud to see that Rocío Marino has become a, a local member of the local parliament. And that reminds me of my time in my city in Alcalá, where I was fighting for these financial allocations. So first of all, I would like to to really steer this criticism that we are sending out in the right direction because we're sending out new arguments on behalf of our spokeswoman, Maria Elena Belga, who is defending specific financial allocations for cooperation instruments. It's the time now to, to work on our advocacy and our lobbying. This will no doubt be approved in the coming months, December, January, as will the 2021 budgets. So as I said, it, now is the right time to defend our interests. I'm very concerned that there isn't a specific budget item like the one that we are trying to find in for other initiatives in, at the local level, which is the impact of climate change in developing countries. And as the platformer team knows very well, we are very interested in tying this in to the Neighborhood Development International Cooperation Instrument. The Commission wants to develop certain more general initiatives and the representative of DEVCO will talk to us about that. But we at the Parliament have the responsibility of defending specific interests, much more specific financial items that concern our fields of action. That was already agreed in the previous legislation to have an agreement between our different instruments, but we really do think that now is a good opportunity to reinforce specific areas, themed areas, not so much geographical areas, because I think that the geographical distribution is already quite well advanced and the focus is currently on Africa. I don't think any further explanations are required in relation to the African continent, where it is all very difficult and has been made worse by the health crisis. But of course, climate change and the impact it has on people, of course, is very important, especially in certain areas in Africa. And so we think that it really is crucial to reinforce some of these themes, some of these topics. And that's where I think we have more room for improvement. The idea is to be able to include programs like this to support climate change, peace, solidarity, programs that can help us to offset certain losses in, for example, geographical areas in Latin America with these new designs, with this new perspective that our uh, former colleague Anna Lixi was talking to us about. I do think it's fundamental to defend cooperation with Latin America and to 
focus on a decentralized form of cooperation because for me if the things stay as they are that's the only way that those countries are going to be able to move forward because bilateral cooperation with the european union would suffer severely in financial setbacks because they depend strongly on COVID, uh, on, on sectors that COVID has affected very severely, such as tourism. Of course, I'm sure that the European Commission should be reinforcing local governments and their cap capabilities more strongly. And I think that decentralized cooperation is important to meet the 2030 agenda. However, I think that the European response to the health crisis under the strategy of Feel Europe has not really taken into account these local regional actors and how much they can contribute. That's why the Commission should really think more about that in the coming stages of application of the strategy, about how we can bring in local authorities and tie them into this new project that has been presented. My proposal is to coordinate efforts between the European Commission and local authorities and local governance systems in partner countries with European delegations, as I was saying. The support that is to be given by the European Union should have an approach based on local needs and should ensure a process for coordination and for multi-level collaboration between members, member states of course, including national and regional governments. So I think that there is a niche for opportunity. Teresa Godoy had already mentioned this that concept of niches for opportunity and decentralized cooperation right now in the situation that we're experiencing with the NIDICI. And I think that this now is opening up new opportunities. We know that European resources will be allocated significantly to climate change. And so we from the Development Commission are working hard towards this new report on initiatives of cooperation, debate, and we, d we focus our efforts on continuing to promote all of the Warsaw agreements and everything that was presented there. Okay. And what we want is for the European Parliament to have a clear position if we are to protect people from climate change. And to do that, we have to reach out to local authorities. We also want the legal instruments that exist to become more flexible so that climate really becomes one of the priority measures for protecting people. And the third objective is purely financial there has to be a budget item specifically for this purpose. This is more and more difficult, I think, but in, if we apply it to these specific theme blocks, we have the chance to improve the proposals from the European Commission in these trialogues that are taking place at the moment. I'd also like to just quickly mention something else and I will sum up with that because I'm much more interested in listening to you Talking about the negotiation of this multi-annual financial framework, we managed to increase funds by many million euros. And so we have been able to really improve, although our, our impression in June was very bad in this respect. Yeah. Having improved our budget by 1 billion is quite significant and by 500 million for humanitarian aid. So I think that one way or another, we have managed to improve our outlook that we had in June. But I think we still need to be working on the Green Deal. And in order to develop that European Green Deal, we need local governments. We are going to carry on lobbying. We're going to carry on raising our voices wherever we can. And together between us with regional authorities and regional actors, I think we really will be able to make ourselves heard so that negotiators and decision makers know that they there cannot be cooperation without local players. So thank yes. you very, very much to everyone. I am here for any questions. Muchas gracias, muchas gracias. Muy interesante y, y es verdad que... Thank you, that was really very interesting. And it's true that you, uh, the European Parliament, are really supporting regional governments and you have been doing that from the very beginning and I wanted to say thank you. 
And in this concept of climate change, which is extremely important in European policy, it's a crucial point for local governments and regional governments. I think we, we should now start to conclude this conversation. Thank you so much to Anna Lixi and Monica Silvana for their contributions. And I would now like to speak to the Andalusian cooperation actors and talk about the specificities of cooperation in this region based on multi-actor, multi-level alliances and the search for coherence in policies in the Agenda 2030 framework. We are convinced here in Platforma that building these alliances between multiple players is crucial in order to ensure local development. And it's also important in the framework of political debate and political communication in terms of the efficacy of exchanges of information. So we will have a first round of questions now before giving the floor to our speakers. We're going to focus a bit on the national and local context. I wanted to say, do you think that this is favorable for decentralized cooperation? And what do you consider to be the added value of Andalusian cooperation at the European level? And also, what does it contribute? What are the most relevant and operational spaces, tools, and instruments for collaboration of and between Andalusian cooperation actors? And also, which do you think should be the priority and strategic issues on which the implementation of a multi-actor alliance in the Andalusian area of cooperation should focus? So I will now give the floor to Olga, the head of the Latin American area for international cooperation and development. Go ahead, the floor is yours. Hello, thank you so much. I'm going to try and be very brief. It's a lot of questions, a lot of very dense questions. Uh, they're very important for us. But first of all, I would like to say thank you to Monica for all of the work that she does campaigning for Latin America. I know that my colleagues who are in charge of the Mediterranean area will be listening to us too. But Latin America, I think we've seen how year after year, the cooperation between Spain and Latin America is disappearing and as Monica said, it's uh, an area where there are huge inequalities and we should perhaps change the way we work. We should change our approach, but in any case, we need to carry on working together. And we have so much to learn from each other and from them. I'm going to focus on the key question that you said about what is the added value of Andalusian cooperation at the European level, the decentralized cooperation. We, as a, a regional agency within the structure that Spain has, where decentralization is a bit of an issue, and in Europe, they don't often understand, they don't fully grasp the structural arrangement of Spain and how we, as a regional agency in a regional government of the Spanish state, have the added value of having always worked with a multi-level and multi-actor approach because being so close to local organizations and to universities and to local organizations is one of our added values it's being here near to them and talking to them working with them with an outward approach so that position of proximity helps us to build multi-actor and multiplayer alliances more easily and we also have one specificity as a regional agency, which is that we are present outside of Spain and outside. We have delegations in partner countries, especially in Central America, Sub-Saharan Africa. And that means that this gives us certain added value and a certain ability to gather and to group together shared interests as a Spanish representative and as a European representative, which helps us to draw up joint programs, joint plans, and to work hand in hand from different levels to target different audiences and working together towards a common goal. 
this has meant that we've been able to work in spaces that are at the level of the European Union. For instance, the Central American integration system and also working with Spain as a state, as a, a national level, where each of us play a different role in supporting the different partners we have in other countries. And going that goes all the way down from the top to territories, to working with FAMSI, to other local authorities. So it's that possibility and that nexus that joins us to all these different level that allows us to work at different levels, different spheres, and to have a different approach towards collaboration. That is the added value that we can bring. Because as I said, of our presence, both at a regional level and externally in different countries. And in the dialogue that we establish with municipalities, with universities, and in short, all of the players that are involved in carrying out and developing our Andalusian cooperation plan for development. Our priority areas have one basic idea, which I think one of our colleagues has summarized earlier, which is that geographization of the 2030 agenda. It's about bringing the 2030 agenda to the territories because territories are where this is really going to be applied. This is where really you will be able to strike the right deals and agreements. So it's, with, it's in that geographization that we're working with local agents and also international agents because we are within this global context where we suffered a crisis, an identity crisis. So now we each have to have our own identity and work together to the common goals that we've defined in this broad agenda and to be connected amongst us. I'm going to be here because I had so much to say, but I think it's time to give the floor to somebody else. Thank you so much. Muchas gracias. Me imagino que ten, Thank you. Que yes, I, muchas cosas I can aquí. imagine that you have a lot to share, a lot to share with us all. So thank you so much, Olga. This idea of multi-level dialogue is essential and it's one of the peculiarities of Andalusian cooperation and Spanish cooperation, which we can't find necessarily in other countries in Europe. So it's really interesting to hear about. I'd now like to give the floor to Manuel Rebaño, the head of municipal, the municipal FAMSI authority. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Marlene. First of all, I'd like to say thank you and congratulations to the organizers, to Monica and Olga, to Ana Lizzi. They've all shared a lot of very interesting ideas that's going to help us carry on working forward in this future that is going to be somewhat uncertain, no doubt. I'd also like to say thank you for inviting me to take part here. As you know, we are partners of Platformer, so thank you to you also for all the work that you're developing and for everything that you're doing towards giving more power to regional and local governments to give us a space there at the European level. We are one of those organizations who have been invited to take part, but there could be so many more here in Andalusia because fortunately in Andalusia, this is a region where we have a lot of people who are very keen to take action, such as the universities where they have very important uh, development departments, cooperation departments. So I think Andalusia one way or another has a, a lot of power to foster this coordinated action on behalf of uh, different territories. I think this has happened sort of organically, it's happened naturally, and I just wanted to draw some attention to that. It's been working really well so far, all of the action that we've taken. And so carrying on from what Monica said, it's important to highlight the value of Andalusia and of all its different players. Uh, 
including the work that has been done in Africa, because we have a link to the African continent, unlike other, unlike many other regions, perhaps because of geographical proximity or because of an understanding of our mutual challenges and problems. So I think Andalusia has a point of view from which it can really help to tackle the issues in Africa. We have been in operation for over 40 years, working with municipalities and and when difficult times have come along or when financial support has come along, we local authorities, local organizations have managed to carry on through thick and thin. We've managed to pursue collaboration and public policies. So I think it's very important to highlight this perseverance of Andalusian players over so many years and having people working all across the region together, working jointly, making agreements to drive cooperation, not only here, but around the world. We have managed to launch a very innovative action, which we have called a cross-sector action, bringing in ideas that are not purely linked to cooperation, to territorial development. I'm talking about urban planning, agriculture, territorial development, companies, business, the business fabric in our region. So we've had contributions of know-how to our local governments from all kinds of different spheres, which I think because of the quality we've achieved should be an example for the sustainable development goals as well. Because Andalusia has with its local governments a lot to say and a lot to contribute. I'd also like to say that ours is not a one-off experience. In Spain, there are nine cooperation development funds in nine different territories that are part of the state initiative, where there is a lot of work being done at a national and regional level. And I would encourage Monica to, um, to really become more familiar with that and to consider the options, the opportunities that it brings for people to be able to work on a, an equal basis with the government, with the national government, whether it's um, the different regions in Andalusia or elsewhere in Spain, all working together and helping to share their voice at a global level. I really think that this is a very interesting element. It's an interesting organization. Um, FAMSI is just one example. There's more, there's one in Italy, which I think is also proving to be extremely fruitful. So not it's not just about territorial development. It's about driving policies, collaboration, having a technical understanding and building a network of players to, to make this whole union more reliable. I think there are ideas that we can share, be it here now or be it elsewhere, so that other territories could follow our example. And I'd also like to add that I think we need to reinforce the importance of dialogue between the European Union and local governments and territories, as you have already rightly said. This whole framework that is being developed in Europe is, is important, but of course it's also equally important for them to understand what's being done regionally. Local governments have a lot to say and have a very important role to play, so it would be interesting to listen to what they have to say about climate change, about territorial development, and the knowledge that they can share with other allies in different countries. And I would even say that I would love for this European development plan to have a global action element in which local governments could work not only inwardly but also outwardly towards Europe because Europe is an, of course an example of construction models and it would be 
very useful to be able to share our ideas on how to pull through this crisis together through cooperation. So thank you very much. Thank you, Manuel. That's very interesting. And this dialogue that is what we have to bring to each of the different territories so to make sure that the initiatives are not stuck in Belgium or in in Europe in the European authorities, that's super important. I would now like to give the floor to Hector Ribeiro, the coordinator of uh, development NGOs in the Andalusian coordination of the NGOs. But I also have another question. What were the limitations to take part in European programs? Because I think you could maybe contribute something different. So thank you very much, Hector. The floor is now yours. Thank you. Well, I'd first of all like to say thank you so much to the organizers of this forum for giving us, the local organizations, these local NGOs here in Andalusia, a chance to speak because we do sometimes want to hear more about contributions to civil society. I think only Olga Pozo was the first one who mentioned the role of civil society organizations. And I think more should be said about this, especially at a time like now, when certain governments, certain political forces, and even cooperation policies are saying that in Spain, things were built from the bottom up. And whenever I'm invited to a university to share my thoughts on cooperation and development, the Andalusian structure was built from the bottom to the top, from local authorities and from civil society upwards. Before there was an, a national Spanish system of cooperation, because Spain in, the, in 1978 was a poor country, it still hadn't quite recovered, it hadn't managed to return its debt. So, at the time, it was a gray, poor country that needed solidarity from other countries. However, at, at that time, the civil society organizations and local authorities were there already working on things, which is why I've wished I'd heard a bit more about the role of civil society, because at the European level, there was a decision in 2012 acknowledging the need for participation in every stage of international cooperation policies on behalf of civil society organizations, because largely those policies ultimately are executed or at least monitored and followed through or driven by these civil society organizations. And also, we are a very well organized, very well articulated structure we, as the Andalusian Coordination Unit, have six smaller departments. We belong to the state, the Spanish State Coordination Unit, and we all work together in a very well-structured manner. And everything is also very proactive. Our collaboration experience with local institutions and with the Andalusian Cooperation Agency has proven to be a sector that's always bringing up new proposals, that's always putting forward new ideas proactively. So I just wanted to really campaign a little bit for the importance of civil society organizations in cooperation policies at the European level. And then in more direct response to the question that Madeleine has proposed, perhaps because of my legal background, we also wish there were more of a regulatory framework. And I do think that uh, Monica Silvana mentioned something about it, but it's about going even beyond that. A tool, a, a regulatory tool that would help us to do something that we have already been doing for a long time. A lot of Andalusian entities and institutions are taking part, they have action in Europe that they have difficulties in terms of standardization and regulatory issues. Because in Spain, 
this regulation hardly adapts at all. The subsidies that are being given are limited to regulating the specificities of the sector, but they struggle to bear in mind regulations in third party countries, which actually rule over our decisions. And they struggle to see the importance of standardization. It takes a lot of time to move things forward. It's difficult to work out the puzzle of financing that we have to work with. And decentralized cooperation in Andalusia also favors or should favor the involvement of Andalusian organizations that currently don't have the capacity, the ability to take part, but that would be able to contribute quite a lot if there were this uh, more favorable regulatory framework. Mm. Yes. Mm. And in this framework, unfortunately, as we have seen recently, there appears to be a lack of political ambition to defend cooperation policies. And so it seems that we're almost doomed to have to work at the European rather than the national level. Hmm. I think that's really the way things should be progressing from now on. Developing a favorable framework for that includes civil society not just through specific projects being launched, but rather by fostering the atmosphere, the environment of participation to include civil society organizations in other spheres where we usually are not able to take part. Thank you, Hector Rivero. Thank you so much for your perspective on civil society, because for us, it's also very important. And it's true that at the European level, we also think it's very important to make that distinction between the roles that civil society plays and the role that local governments play, which are the ones that are elected and have a more of a, a political responsibility. But we really do promote this collaboration at the European level. So I think that what you've just shared is very important. Thank you so much. We're running a little bit behind schedule. So I'm now going to leave you with Johanna Fernandez. Johanna, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Marlene. Hello to everyone. As that is how we're saying at the beginning of the session, we're now going to encourage everyone in the audience to take part uh, interactively. So we want to invite you to answer the two short questions that we have launched on the link that we've just left you in the chat box now. It will take you no more than a minute. So in the meantime, I'm going to start sharing my screen so that we can see the results of this first question. And that will give you time to open up that link, read the questions and send us your answers. You can see my screen, right? If you don't mind what we could do, Johanna, while people are answering the questions, we could start 
discussing some of the questions people have sent for our keynote speakers today. There is a very specific question, or two in fact, for Anna. On the one hand, Anna, you talked about the five priority lines that are established in this new framework. And the question is, where, where do we see the importance of health in those priority lines? And the second question, which I also want to say is, could you specify the role of European Union delegations in this new framework? Yes, thank you, Teresa. I saw those two questions. Of course, health is a, pro a priority topic, especially now since COVID, and no doubt it will continue to be. And I'm saying it's priority at the moment because as a result of this health crisis that began with COVID, the commissioner instantly ordered that a organized communication be issued to structure how action should be taken in each country to address the COVID crisis. And it was decided that some of the funds that had not been allocated should be made available to this new health issue in order to draw up a new approach that is called the Team Europe Initiative. And Monica Silvana mentioned it earlier. So with this Team Europe Initiative, they have defined a system of collaboration between the European Commission and all of the member states in order to help partner countries to a COVID crisis. That, of course, is currently underway. And in terms of looking ahead at the future, the fact that we haven't mentioned this health, it doesn't mean that it's not part of the priorities in different countries. Of course, some partner countries will have their own programs and they will have already identified health as a key topic. Because we must remember that cooperation, development cooperation is always rests upon the principle of ownership, the principle that we shouldn't have this top-down approach, approach, but this bottom-up approach. So it's the partner countries who, according to their own regional development plans, should define their own priorities. Well, these delegations, in relation to your other question, have a very important role to play. Now that the programming guidelines have been defined, it is stated in those guidelines that consultation should be made with local authorities. It's important to communicate with local authorities. So then each delegation or each delegation head will have to decide how to structure this, how to actually carry it out. Because of course, we can't foresee consultation with absolutely all local authorities, that would be impossible. But they would be sort of filtered through the national systems. And that's in the hands of our delegation, fellow delegation members. Great, thank you, Anna. I'm going to announce two very specific questions about some countries and their specificities. On the one hand, we have Felipe Manzano asking about the challenge of Hungary and Poland. How does their position affect the climate of cooperation among different states? What would it mean uh, if we bound this to uh, non-compliance of human rights? Could we not have more direct formulas beyond the states? to communicate directly. And there's also a question from Placido, which says, how can we include Venezuela, a Caribbean country which has been considered to be going through a very complex health crisis? How could we include that country inside the 2021-2027 budgets uh, from our fund, from our Andalusian fund? I think, Olga, that the second question is for you, and the first is 
for whoever would like to answer it. Perhaps Monica or Anna? Yes, if you like, I could, first of all, just uh, answer some of the European topics, or would you prefer it to be Anna? It's up to you. Yes, no, you go for it, Monica. Right, well, first of all, I'd like to talk a bit more about what Hector said, because he's absolutely right. It's important to standardize these regulations. That's one of the things he said, and that's one of the next things, the next priorities I think I'm going to talk about in my office, because every time I come to one of these forums, somebody brings up this regulatory issue. And there was a more specific question about a claim. Why is the why does the recovery plan not include an external point of view? Maybe Anna from DEFCO could explain this better, but the explanation that we are given, that we've been hearing over the past few months, is that there is a legal conflict. The recovery plan cannot have an outward working approach. It cannot be included. All of this external policy can't be included in the recovery plan. That's the explanation that we've been given by the European commissioners when we raised this issue of humanitarian aid. There was also another question that was mentioning the blockage on behalf of Poland and Hungary. And I believe, although probably my colleagues could answer this better, that blocking is against the funds of the recovery plan. So the multi-annual financial framework will, in theory, carry on as expected. So that blockage that they're carrying out is to try to hamper the recovery plan rather than the MFF, because the recovery plan funds don't, in theory, include items for collaboration, outward collaboration, external. So, But Anna can correct me if I'm wrong in saying that. And yes, I think that what we should be reinforcing is decentralized cooperation and perhaps also by including formulas based on the South-South. Because what I appear to be seeing is that at a national level, they're not always transmitting the willingness to cooperate that we have at a European level. So that's something that has to be reinforced, this national cooperation. When we see that there are new programs that are really important for collaboration, the priorities of the partner country that we're working with are not always fully aligned with ours. So that's where I think decentralized cooperation can really play an important role because this European national partnership can't always address all of the matters. I'd like to say congratulations because I think there are, I think 87 people connected and that's a really good turnout for half past two in the afternoon on a Friday. Well, before we give the floor to Olga to answer our question, Anna, would you like to? Yes, there are two absolutely spot on elements that Monica has mentioned. It's this external component of the recovery plan, next generation EU. It's something that I already mentioned earlier. The, this announcement that was made about the Team Europe initiative towards COVID for partner countries. So it's not strictly EU countries, but partner countries. That's the tool. Those are the actions that were launched in order to shape a recovery plan for non-EU countries. But I don't have anything else to add to what Monica said about the veto of Hungary and Poland, because absolutely, yes, the battle that they are fighting or the, the difficulties that, that they are posing are against this recovery plan, but we're not sure how this is going to pan out. And there's nothing really I can add because I don't have any further knowledge on the matter. Olga? 
Well, yes, as you said, this is a humanitarian crisis and therefore Andalusian cooperation is addressing this issue. So it's not that Venezuela isn't a priority country for Andalusian cooperation. The definition of priority countries is not made by us as the agency, but rather it has to be done with an agreement of the entire Andalusian society. So we bring into that decision civil society organizations, local authorities, universities, and all of the players that one way or another are linked to international development communication. They are the ones that we all together define priority countries. So not having specified Venezuela doesn't mean that we're not working to help them because it is a humanitarian crisis. We are working to help them. There are people from Venezuela in Ecuador, elsewhere, in all sorts of different countries where we do have constant programs underway and where we foster these programs to help in humanitarian support and aid. So through the Andalusian civil society as well, work is being done to support them. And they're the ones who really are draw our attention to the problems that are going on and need to be addressed. And so including or excluding Venezuela from the list of priority countries for Andalusian collaboration depends on everyone, not just on us. Well, thank you very much, Olga. We have a, a comment from Rocío Román in relation to what Manuel Redaño was saying, and it's about the importance of strengthening local organizations and having this decentralization in order to communicate with countries outside Europe through our national structures. There are a lot of participants who are wondering how can we ensure local authorities take part in this redefinition of the instruments that we work with, and you've mentioned it a little bit, but we haven't really discussed it more specifically. And there's another question from Emilio Rabasco in relation to whether or not it is possible, I think maybe Anna could answer this question or maybe Monica, whether it is possible to revisit this decentralized cooperation because a lot of funds in regions where there is decentralized cooperation and where local authorities are involved, a lot, often we miss out because the funds are, are given to more national authorities. So you mean delegated co cooperation? Yes, that's right. Emilio, thank you for your question. At this time, I can't really add anything more than what I said earlier. Decentralized cooperation is acknowledged in the NIDICI. It mention is made to it in this instrument. As long as we understand decentralized collaboration to refer to collaboration with European funds in order to fund partnerships between local and regional governments in the European Union and in partner countries. The idea is to be able to continue that collaboration the way it was before, which doesn't necessarily mean using the same modalities, the same structures, because we will have a new single budget line for local authorities, but we don't yet know if back when this cooperation line existed, which attributed money to each of the different delegations, we still don't know how much was allocated to each delegation in the different callings to support decentralized collaboration. So we don't know how many there were we did try to really drive them to encourage them over the past few years. We've launched a series of callings solely for constituting new partnerships. 
So I think what we had in the past is something that could be also repeated in the future, but it depends on how the negotiation takes place between local authorities and EU representatives in the different member states. So it's going to take a lot of engagement on behalf of national associations and local authorities in the various countries. I'm not sure if anyone else would like to talk about delegated collaboration. Emilio, perhaps you have something to add? I've done it through the chat box because there's not much time. Okay, well, we're going to launch just one last question because we're already running three minutes late. Before we give the floor to Pablo, just to conclude all of this session that we've been holding and also announcing a few challenges for us to take home with us. So the last question refers to how is all of this going to affect asylum and refugee policies and what local what role will local authorities play in this? Yes, well, um, um, when the time and allows it, this this um, fall, does not fall on the, uh, the responsibility of our uh, directorate. It, so yeah, well, I've been following the presentations that uh, under the, the new immigration pact and the new pilots with different critiques. Um, I listened to the explanations that uh, the commissar um, gave us um, regarding the policy that she presented. So I wouldn't dare to say anything that's not um, solely something that I can say from, from a role as a development actor. What I'm trying to do is uh, try to link, to connect with uh, the directorate, which takes care of migration issues. That's not us, that's a different a group of colleagues. So we can reinforce um, the role that the local authorities can play um, when it comes to these kind of issues, uh, on the other hand, we're doing this not only with uh, the team that takes care of migration uh, issues inside of DG DIFCO, uh, but also working together with DG OM. That way we see that we can do something, taking into account that we lack any kind of leadership in migration issues because that's something that uh, belongs to a, a different department. So what we are trying to definitely is to reinforce, to create an alliance between us and the committee of the regions and also the uh, internal issues DG, which takes care of this uh, phenomenon and try to find out if thanks to our cooperation, we can um, keep pushing and reinforcing the role that local and regional authorities play. This is a uh, more precise thing that we are doing right now uh, from our side. Uh, what Monica said before, what Monica Silvana said before was very interesting. I will, I, I've sent her a message because I would definitely like to, I would definitely like to see how we can determine, determine not just a relationship, with the colleagues who take care of uh, migration issues and uh, internal uh, matters and the committee of the regions, which is what we are trying to do already. But go back to that, what she said, try to reinforce uh, decentralized uh, cooperation on one side, um, migration and climate change. So we can uh, do something about them from our DG and take care of uh, climate change. That would be a very uh, interesting possibility. Uh, I will try to do what I can from, from the inside. 
Um, somebody said something, um, and I, I would like to answer to that. I would too believe that the um, expectations, at least for us who are working from here, is developing this, this relation between issues, uh, climate, cooperation, and development. I would also like to answer to the uh, five pillars of the Migration Pact, which needs to make its way to the Parliament. From my political family, we definitely believe that uh, that is the first step uh, that we need to that we need to make to get to a migration policy which uh, we all share. Uh, instead of leaving countries like, for example, uh, Spain, who are taking care alone uh, of this kind of problems. And yesterday took place a very high level uh, meeting in which uh, it's a solid person of the parliament from the Lion to uh, present the commission uh, participated and the major of Lampedusa and uh, Lesbos, they uh, also participated there. I do think that it is very important to have this, uh, this link, this virtual link from Europe. We are seeing that we are leaving our majors alone who are actually taking care of this migration issues on their own. Uh, we're all shocked by all the pain and all the deaths that we see, but definitely somebody who sees that from, uh, from a closer distance, um, it is definitely a higher shock. We're opening the debate uh, on different issues so we can advance and move forward. Definitely we need a definition about what is a, a political um, 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 from these European institutions, it's important we have this debate. And the European Union needs to make more flexible the tools that they have, for example, uh, so they can include climate as one of the main issues to take care of. Uh, we also talked about the possibility of the humanitarian visa and uh, climatic uh, refugees. This is something that we vote in the parliament, that, but we lost this vote. That is the way that we want to go. We want to see how we can land this idea in Spain with this uh, direct relation between climate development and uh, migration. We are going to keep going in this direction. And we definitely want to, looking forward to uh, keep fighting for this course uh, together with you. Thank you for your time and your attention. It has been definitely a good experience being here, so uh, we will keep deepening. Well, it has been a, definitely a enriching dialogue. And uh, we would like to thank Anna, Olga, Milen, Monica, and also Hector for the participation. Uh, Pablo Martinez is a, a political science teacher. And well, after all that we have listened to, I don't know if there is something that you would like to say about it, if you can sum up somehow. Well, thank you all. When Teresa and Joanna called me to uh, participate, um, to close the sessions with uh, uh, some challenges, well, first of all, um, I told them that I don't have a, a a deep knowledge about the uh, financial, multi-annual financial framework. I definitely did not expect to learn so much and uh, be so interested in what has been said. I do believe that uh, the debate is relevant and it comes uh, at the right time because the negotiations, are, negotiations about the framework take place right now. So. Um, I would definitely like to talk about three ideas which I think are relevant and uh, in some way uh, all three have been mentioned in some way but I would like to highlight them once again. Uh, during negotiations uh, the last years uh, when we have been trying to define uh, financial uh, tools. I always insisted that we find ourselves in a very important time and definitely we should leave, uh, we should stop working on some strategies that we want to uh, 
apply that we want to implement so we can um, keep our activity. And we need to understand that these tools are public policy instruments and that as long as it's possible, they must be, they must innovate and they must uh, make so many changes as possible regarding the roles that uh, we expect to play in the future. Since we will actually be participating in the implementation of this uh, public policy, this way um, we should do as much as we can so this uh, multi-annual uh, financial framework can be adapted to these new tools. I think that's important right now. I don't want to talk in depth about it because all of you are specialists in, in this field, but you know that we have this challenge in the 2030 agenda. It's also recognized uh, by the financial framework, but when it comes to the challenges, we need to take into account that after this uh, framework uh, is over, we will have one or two years uh, to get to the end of the, um, to achieve our uh, 2030 agenda, which means that somehow all the um, ambitious transformations that are included in this agenda um, should definitely at least go in the right way, in the right direction. With this in mind, I would also like to talk about uh, the ones, the, the three uh, challenges which I consider the most important at this time, at least from the uh, field of uh, decentralized uh, cooperation. From my point of view, uh, this is uh, definitely a, a transforming uh, potential. Uh, we have been uh, very important actors uh, when we started talking about this decentralization when no one talked about it. And well, this might have been understood from a, from a technocratic point of view. But they have also been very important when talking about uh, articulation spaces from diff for different levels. Uh, there was something that was um, definitely needed in, in different spaces, and it has also played a role in the development of uh, territorial and local uh, approaches when it comes to development. It has also been a space uh, from which we have talked with, um, we have spoken with uh, much freedom. And it has been it has been this way because since it is from the bottom to the top, it was sometimes not limited by certain factors that some others need to take into account when it comes to geopolitical. And while well, these five elements are have been definitely pilots, and with this in mind, we would like to highlight that uh, when it comes to cooperation, we all have an important role to play. Not only at subsidiary... Uh, I'm not going to go on much longer, but I think that these can be really very important aspects in in our future steps without adding too much content. So first of all, I think that I, it's really important to have heard what Anna had to say, and I'm so grateful. I, I think she has really been clairvoyant in her expression, in her explanation. I would be happy to include her her speech, her explanation in any master's class for students. And so deducting what I could from what she said, I think that we do have a skeleton, we have a structure, but it has huge limitations in that hamper the work that we have to do on a multi-dimensional, multi-sector basis. I cannot imagine what it would be like to work with uh, social organizations and human rights without addressing aspects such as climate change or inequalities. And 
picking up on what Monica said, talking about one topic and not the other. So basically, they're all linked, and that's one of the things that we mustn't lose sight of. We've also had another example mentioned about uh, fast tracks. We can't focus on emergencies without narrowing the gap between inequalities or vouching for democratic governance. What I'm trying to say is that we can fight against the COVID pandemic and create new inequalities, just as we can fight climate change and also heighten inequality. So that's the challenge that we're seeing in the Agenda 2030. It's about this multi-sector, multi-player collaboration. When we come across instruments that force us to focus on a specific topic or a specific geography or both conditions, then of course they're always limiting our actions. And I believe that there are spaces in which we can talk about this. I think I heard someone say that there are, it was Anna maybe mentioning the challenges. And she, she talked about the framework where she sees uh, opportunities for local governments, regional governments, and that this could perhaps be a place in which we can experiment and establish new actions, new projects that do respond to that multi-dimensional, multi-sector, structure that we have to work with. But I can't be sure, I don't have the data and we've heard from other people, other speakers, uh, that the way that financing frameworks are designed and there are, whenever there is a chapter called Global Challenges, in actual fact, it's just a sort of uh, huge empty, it's a huge box where everyone keeps throwing all of these different topics in, in a sort of mix. I wish that yes, we could we could improve in this way, and hopefully that's something that we'll be able to explore in the future. This that I'm about to say has a lot to do with geographical limitations. I think they are crucial. It's about how can we guarantee that with these new instruments, we are actually listening, we're actually hearing the voice of local governments, local authorities because this geographical framework is going to be predominantly a space for bilateral communication and solely two-way two communication and national state communication. So there's a challenge there. It's a challenge in the limitations that we have in truly having multi-level communication, multi-level structures. That's where I think we can all take one step forward where we can build on coordination, build on the mechanisms to achieve that coordination. And we can also take a new step forward in the old agenda, the previous agenda, because there's still a lot left to be done. That's the decentralization agenda. It, and it's still very much present in a lot of the countries we work with. And so just to really say it simply, adding decentralization plus a territorial approach, plus multi-level, our organization is a formula that would give rise to true trans-territorial spaces. And I mean that in two different senses. I mean it in terms of trans-border, cross-border, but also trans-competency, so across different competencies. It may not be the right word choice, perhaps this trans choice isn't the best, but uh, it's Ultimately, I think these are really important aspects in it's this idea of co-governance that we need to be building on. We need co-governance that is able to scale beyond uh, the regions, but that is also able to listen to the regions and their challenges which are trans-territorial, transnational, which cross borders. So. I don't think, I know it's not Olga who defines the geographical priorities, but it doesn't really matter. As long as we define something according to an administrative reality that we truly understand, or that we don't understand rather, we are hampering our own work in developing these trans-territorial initiatives that I was just talking about. And I also wonder whether within those regional programs, which traditionally were a place where we could suggest trans-territorial or cross-border initiatives. I'm not sure whether perhaps this is the right place 
which we could broaden it to to encompass new ideas and ultimately the goal it's it's a bit like in other collaborative departments every year what we do is we manage to narrow down the sectorial structure and then when it comes to multi-sector approaches they get bigger and bigger and and they take up 50 or 60 percent of the importance of bilateral dialogue in relation to multi-player alliances and partnership i think someone suggested that the european union does have a clearer point of view on this or is addressing it from a more clear point of view I think that there are spaces, especially in Latin America, which is very important for Andalusian collaboration, that need to be explored, where we need to broaden them. And I think it was Olga, and perhaps Monica, who also mentioned this South-South collaboration. And I'm aware that there is an interest in doing so in the European Union. It involves, the European Union involves uh, delegated cooperation, South-South cooperation, so in short, I think that that is a space where we can really bring to fruition all of these ideas of proximity, horizontal participation that we were mentioning earlier. And actually, I'm surprised that no one mentioned that specifically today, that local players, local players and players in social organizations, and especially local social organizations, need to try and chip in to these spaces, to this recontextualization of collaboration. That, I think, could be one of the possible way forwards. And I'd just like to finish off with two things that I didn't hear anyone mention. And that is the fact that among the priorities we have, people are not putting enough emphasis on generating knowledge. There may be two reasons for this. The 2030 agenda is full of very important, very urgent challenges, and perhaps that's because there are there is good and evil in the world, and that applies to all fields. Or perhaps it's because we don't know how to do certain things, because it's a complex world, it's getting more and more complex, and we, if you allow me the expression, we don't know how to develop countries that go beyond the sustainability goals that are given to us whenever it comes to developing a country, we look high up and we look too high up, I think. This challenge is um, more territorial and I think that's a lot of work can be done. And I think that here it's crucial to invest in research because science, a lot of which is being done in universities, science needs to be linked to decision-making world would be a worse place if we hadn't had the idea of setting up this intergovernmental panel on climate change. And this means that no politician now is unaware of what it means for the temperature of the earth to raise two degrees. Okay, so that's just one of the examples of how this communication between science and politics is so important. And that should also be part of this funding framework. And another point that I'm going to add, I not sure if I actually answered the question before, that, but the first thing that came to me when I read the question uh, was the topic of experience. So I'm going to just raise a controversial idea. When someone says, Pablo has a lot of experience, I often think that they're calling me an old man. It's a joke, but really what I mean is that we have to embrace this cooperation because we do have experience old or young, we have experience, whether it's up, down, or down, up. We have a generational issue. We have a, an issue because young people nowadays are really being, uh, really doing a lot towards uh, gender issues and social awareness, but sometimes the issues that they focus on are not the most important or not the most pressing, let's say. And it would also be interesting to include in these priorities, these, these multi-stakeholder alliances, it would be important to include the younger generations because they can help us to make changes that we are maybe struggling to work with. And I won't go on any longer. Thank you so much to everyone. 
I don't know if I've really helped round anything up, but uh, hopefully shared a few interesting ideas. Thank you so much, Pablo. So we're going to try and just conclude quite quickly because we've gone quite a long time past the time we were supposed to. It's just going to be 30 seconds and then Pablo, I think, will finish off. We have the Mentimeter tool that Pablo mentioned earlier. And so I want to say to Anna and everyone that although we haven't been able to include everyone who's spoken today, there have been people in charge of the Huelva delegations, Jaén, all of the various different areas and municipalities in Spain, also public companies that are very active in decentralized collaboration, municipal authorities, provincial authorities as well, working on uh, wastewater, social services. Also the media, we've had the municipal media in Andalusia who are again, very important in collaboration. We've had representatives from NGOs, social economy, who've also played a huge part in this decentralized governance. And they help us to define the topic from a much broader perspective and from a different perspective. There are also universities in Andalusia, many of which have been present. The International University of Andalusia has been present. They are a very important ally in Andalusia and an important ally for FAMSI. We've also had Arturo Chica with us, the deputy vice chancellor of one of the universities. And he represents an authority who has done a lot to move to organize this. So, Arturo, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Emilio. First of all, I'd like to congratulate everyone for the way this webinar has taken place, especially Incidem, because we have seen uh, all of the strengths and weaknesses that we have. And I'd also like to thank FAMSI for inviting me to take part in the coordination We've already got together in other forums and other congresses and training courses and so on. This is the way forward, as we have seen in this session. It's about strengthening our multi-actor, multidisciplinary initiatives. It's about opening up new opportunities that are complementary to help in financing and cooperation in order to reduce inequality. The University of Andalusia will be there to help drive this cooperation always and hopefully there is something that we can do towards providing this new contribution this new generation of uh, of drivers of change that it's written into our dna thank you so much and i look forward to seeing you in mid-december on the next forum thank you very much Thank you, everyone. We'll conclude here and now. Thank you so much. Thank you. See you at the next forum. Bye. Thank you, Marlene, Anna, and everyone. Take care, everyone.